You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to True Wealth. I'm Dave Basconi, and here with me is Maria Smith. Hi, Maria. How are you today? Hi, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, I can't complain. I, um, good day so far. Uh, I do have to tell you that I think we're getting close to graduation day uh, for the barn swallows. Um, are you familiar with the barn swallows? Uh, not too much. Uh, now, some swallows, the tree swallows and the barn swallows, one of them is has more of a green, greenish um, glow to them, a greenish tint. Well, these are the bluer. These are the okay. barn swallows. Okay. That's the blue yeah. version. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Every year they, they nest in my barn, and they're really good birds. I mean, I like seeing them flying around the barn area. They eat a ton of insects. And yes, you know, the they eat a lot of mosquitoes. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Which is so nice. The, yeah. Yeah, between them and the bats. I haven't seen any bats where we are now, but uh, I have seen them in other places. But uh, these barn swallows seem to be everywhere. But, uh, yeah, they they eat the insects that would be a pest for me and, and the horses. But anyhow, uh, these newborn are soon to leave the nest. Um, uh, I've uh, I've been checking on them here recently, and uh, just earlier there were three heads out of the nest, uh, looking out of the nest at me, and uh, I can see they were much bigger than they were just a week or ten days ago. And um, so either the adults push them out when they're ready or they take the flight on their own. I'm, I'm not sure. Do you know which uh, how it's done? Do I know which what? Do you know how it's done? Do the uh, When the birds, uh, the young, are ready to, to go to leave the nest, do they get pushed out by the adults, or do they just take flight on their own? I think they I get think pushed out. Yeah, I, I think the adults know. There's something about uh, they know when the, the young ones are ready, and uh, they go, okay, time to hit the road. Because uh, if you think about it, uh, teenagers, they like to lay around, and uh, eat food and, and uh, play computer games, so they they probably don't want to leave the nest. Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah, and I got to tell you, these adult birds, they, there's a lot of work, and uh, from you know getting the, getting these young ones to uh, to take the flight because um, in the summertime I tend to leave the barn doors open anyhow. But um, they're constantly in and out. And once I know there's a nest in, I, I always leave them open because they, they're flying in and out all the time. And I don't want to lock them out, lock them in or lock them out. But uh, anyhow, um, uh, I, I see them. They can swoop under a door, and these doors go up and down. So uh, at night, uh, if you leave maybe like a two-foot uh, space, uh, two feet high, uh, I'll see them swoop in under that. They, they they don't have to. The door doesn't have to be wide open. Any little space they can find to get in, they'll swoop right in. They're amazing flyers. That's the other thing. Yeah, yeah. We used to have a lot around here. There used to be an old barn, and I remember it was yep. so wonderful in the summer. There were no mosquitoes, and I was like, "Thank you for those those barn swallows that are taking care of our mosquitoes." And they took down the barn, and now we've always had mosquitoes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, uh, they, they they literally eat a in quotes a ton of mosquitoes for their weight. Uh, and if you get a bunch of them, which I have several in the area, um, I think that's the reason why there's very few mosquitoes. And you know the fly there's always flies around a horse farm, but uh, not like uh, not like uh, it would be if they weren't here. So anyhow, yeah. But uh, okay, I think we covered our uh, nature study for, for the moment, uh, unless you want to add something else to it, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. We are getting close to graduation day here at the barn. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. No, it, it's so true with human beings and with birds. It's the parents have to say, you know, it's time. I think, you know, with the birds, it starts to get a little crowded there. Those uh, older baby birds are just taking up so much room and taking up a lot of energy, like you said, for the parents, you know, to feed them all the time. Yeah, the parents are going enough. 
uh, you know, these guys are, uh, they've got feathers, they've got wings. Okay. Uh, like I said, hit the road here. So, um, but, uh, okay. Hey, we were talking uh, a couple of days back. Uh, there was an adage I came across, and um, I thought it might be an interesting discussion. So, um, if you want, I can read it and then give you a couple of quick thoughts and then love to hear what you have to say. Okay. So the adage goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now, again, I came across that and it sounded interesting and started thinking about it. There's all kinds of everyday examples. The one that came to my mind was hiking. If uh, if you want to go fast, you, you need to go alone because when we used to go hiking with the scouts, those hikes took forever because it was a big group. You had the slow kids, the slow adults. Uh, there was always something happening. Someone was getting scratched and you had to stop. And So, but, so if you're a fast hiker, I would suggest uh, going alone. But um, on the other hand, a family goes together, not fast, but deeper into the life experiences. Um, and that's the difference, I think. Far, in this case, in the case of a family, uh, goes deeper into the life experiences. And because now you're dealing with a spouse and children, and that always brings about a lot of interesting challenges. Um, I mean, sometimes we need to go fast, and sometimes we need to go far. Um how does that sound so far uh, in my breakdown, at least in the natural? Yeah, it sounds absolutely perfect, yeah. Okay. Um, however, in the spiritual life, I, I don't think that adage applies, and that we are not supposed to go it alone. Um, we, in my opinion, are, are like my horses. Uh, we are herd creatures. And um, horses don't like being by themselves. And, and I see it when three of them get out of sight of the fourth. And as, as soon as that horse realizes they're, they're alone or by themselves, they run to join the other three. And horses are just designed that way. And uh, now us, in our spiritual life, we too are designed by our creator to be with him. We're not supposed to go it alone because basically we can't. Uh, I think a lot of problems surface when we try it alone. So that's my take on the on the supernatural, the spiritual side of that adage. Uh, how does that sound? Okay, let me just get this um, straight. We're not supposed to go alone. Who are we supposed to go with? No, no, no. Uh, I think in the uh, uh, in the spiritual life. Uh, where it says, the adage says, if you want to go fast, go alone. I don't think we are designed to go alone in the spiritual life, okay? I'm saying we're not supposed to go alone, that we are to go together. Because in the spiritual life, uh, we are designed to be uh, with God, and uh that's just part of our design. Just like horses, the, the example I was given with the horses, they, they are herd creatures, herd animals. They want to be together. Uh, we have a design as well, and our design is to be with God. So we have to go together. Together with God or together with, with other people to God. Well, 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 I'm talking in the, well, yes, you can expand it to that. In the spiritual life, uh, we are designed to go with God, and also then that would trickle down into our spiritual life of, with other people as well. Yes. Um, that's, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Yes. Yeah, that's why I wasn't, I wasn't quite um, sure about exactly what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. We do need, we have to be with God. And we also do, because we are herd animals. No man is an island. We are meant to go with others. But there's a caveat there. We can't just go with others. Our relationship with God has to be individual and exclusive as well as inclusive of others. And others, insofar as they help us to draw closer to God, 
in whatever way. And it could be in a negative way, too. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a supportive, encouraging way. It could be in a negative way that makes us realize um, how much we need God, how much they need God. And if we realize how much other people need God and we look truthfully at ourselves, we see how much we also need God. So it can propel us to get closer to God when we see somebody who is in such need of God and refuses to go there. So even that would be a negative way of drawing us closer to God. But exactly, we can, we're can. we not made to live alone. We're not made to live alone either on earth, except for very rare exceptions when we think of the hermits in our Catholic faith. And yet, you know, those hermits, didn't a lot of people go and visit them all the time? <laughs> well, they, we certainly know about them because people did visit them and they wrote about them, I think, you know, or they found yeah. their writings later. Yeah, yeah. They were hermits, I think, maybe because they chose to live in odd places by themselves, uh, but uh, they had contact, I, I think, because I think once a wise hermit was discovered, people wanted to go and learn from them, so... Uh, but, yeah, and, and that's the thing. You can always find exceptions. When I was starting to see, you're doing the same thing I did. When I was starting to think through it, you can, um, even in the natural world, in, in, in the world, you can find reasons to be alone, but then, uh, then you need to go together. And I think it's the together, as the adage says, is that that's where you go far. Uh, and, and again, the family in my mind is um, the perfect example because you learn how to live with other people. You learn, you know, you have a spouse, you have children, and that's all very interesting. I can, I can remember uh, sharing a cubicle at work many years ago with a bachelor. He was pretty much a confirmed bachelor, and he just chose to live life that way. He had a lot of outside activities, he was into sports and a bunch of things. So, But I could tell um, he was very knowledgeable about the mechanics of a racing bike, but when you started talking to him about family life, he was pretty shallow uh, and wasn't really that interested. So um, that's the difference, I think, uh, uh, to go far into life as we know it, most of us know it, uh, with, you know, dealing with family members, you got to be a part of a family. It's not something you just read about or hear about on the news. you got to live it. And uh, you certainly don't go fast because um, with a family, as we all know, <laughs> I remember trying to get ready to go to the grandparents in the wintertime. It took a half an hour just to load all the stuff in the car, uh, you know? So you certainly don't go fast, so I guess that's a way to learn patience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, you, you know, the friend that you were talking about or the person you were talking about who was a bachelor, and it's not just it's family. I mean, that is the most important and the most common way, but it's also, it's really a community. Let's say you don't have family, you didn't get married, and your parents are deceased, and, you know, your siblings, if you had any, live far away. So perhaps you don't have family, but you need a community. Everybody needs a community. And, of course, you think of the religious who leave their families and don't see them very often at all, but are part of a community life. So what we do need is other human beings. And then there's the uh, there's actually something that I was talking about with somebody just over the weekend, you know, our family is so important, and most people realize that, even people who are not religious, they realize the importance of family or they realize how much a family can hurt you if you don't have a family that is loving and nurturing. Um, but the family that's really important, which actually is over and above any blood ties, any bonds by blood, blood relations, is the family by grace, which means that people who also love God, they are our true brothers and sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our children. Our spiritual family, even here on earth, is the superior, is the greater family, is the greater bond. Because 
So somebody who isn't married but is part of a community of believers, working and caring for each other, that is essential to be a human being, helping each other to support other people. The problem is in our modern world, so many people don't get married, so many younger, older people, 30, 40, 50, because getting, you know, having, having a spouse and children is a lot of work, a lot of responsibility, a lot of headache. Um, I mean, the rewards come later. I mean, you know, and the reward, I mean, when the children are small, you get some rewards too, but basically it's a lot of work. So they're shirking that responsibility, but they're also, like you're saying, not going deeper into life, not really able to experience the joy, the goodness, the, the wealth of emotion, of the emotional and spiritual life. Anyway, I talked a lot. I rambled a little bit. But basically, I wanted to get to you don't necessarily have to be married, but you do need to be part of a community, a family or a community. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a family with siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles, although that's really what we think about when we talk about having a community. But it can also be a community of like-minded people who are working to serve God and to serve one another, and that actually is the better, the greater, the superior. What God wants us to do is to take our blood relatives, our family of origin, and our family that we create with spouses and children, and become a family that is spiritual. But if that earthly family doesn't become a spiritual family, then it really it, it misses its whole purpose. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent point. Uh, that's a good way to look at it. And as you were talking uh, about need, the need for community and all and the different levels, uh, it reminded me of something. This was Dr. Rhonda wrote a book, and uh, she uh, talked about spiritual, because you were talking about a spiritual family. I think in this book she talked about a spiritual friendship, and that is the deepest kind of friendship. And the other two examples given, and I don't remember the exact labeling of them, but there's a friendship that's very uh, on the surface. Um, the people you see at work, uh, your car's in the garage or has to be, go to the garage, and you ask a, a coworker to give you a ride, uh, the next day, and sure enough, uh, you know, uh, as a friendly gesture, they do it. But if you were to leave the company or part ways, that friendship is pretty much gone because it was just a surface, a utility kind of friendship. And then there's another level that's deeper, and kind of like a common interest. Uh, for example, you might like plays or you might like a certain sports team or something like that. And so you, your your friendship is quite good based on that. It's a deeper than that utility friendship. And uh, But once again, if you part company with them for whatever reason, maybe you move to another state, eh, you may stay in touch with them on occasion, send them a few cards. But um, um, that's not the same as what she mentioned about a spiritual friendship. There, you have a common bond through God. Uh, God is the the medium or the channel. Uh, your, your, it's your spiritual life that ties you to these people, and because of that, distance doesn't change that friendship. Distance or time or well, nothing really uh, can affect that kind of friendship because it's a spiritual friendship through a love of God, and uh, you can maybe go a long time. But, between communications or whatever, but it, there's something about that bond, about that friendship, that you're still as current as you were the, the last time you talked to them. So I think there's a lot of things that can come out of uh, this, uh, this relationship, whether it's with a family or a community, and the more spiritual it is, the deeper it is. And that's what was intended by God. That's what was intended by our Creator, and that's what, how we are designed. Uh, that, that's how I boil it all down. I mean, it's a major topic. I mean, this thing can go in all kinds of directions, but that's how I would boil it down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's um, the spiritual friendship is the deepest, and it's the friendship that 
is the most important, and it's the one that God wants us to have with one another, no matter whom. With parents and children, you know, as the children get older, of course, that is the, that, that is the goal of every single relationship, whether it's with siblings, parents, children, spouses, whether it's with friends, the goal is to have the deepest spiritual connection. And if it doesn't achieve that goal, it really does miss the mark. The other ones, um, the other friendships, you know, have their have their benefits, of course. But um, and the most oh, important oh, friendship is that friendship with God. God wants us to first and foremost have this deep, intimate relationship with Him and with others. And the more we love God, the more He will give us the graces and His own love with which to love other people and with which to love ourselves because that's a really important factor that a lot of people um, just don't realize that how important it is to love ourselves correctly, rightly. There is unfortunately kind of like it seems two kinds of people if I'm going to generalize in this situation. There are people who love themselves quote unquote too much but that's really not true love. They just want to get the most attention, they want to get the best seats in places. They, you know, they feel like they're entitled. That's people who, who have a wrong, too much love of a, it's a wrongful love. Then there's others who don't have enough love at all. It's not a wrongful love. It's just not they don't have enough love. They're always trying to take care of other people. And while that's a good thing, if you don't love yourself and take good care of yourself. The care that you're giving to other people is going to be warped in some way. And eventually the people who are doing too much for other people, and you know, you've seen this with, you see this with parents, you see this with children, you see, you know, with their older elderly parents, you see this in many relationships, even in friendships where one person is doing too much, then they finally realize, you know, I'm doing too much and they start resenting it. Whereas they were doing too much, but they weren't supposed to. They were not loving themselves. They were giving too much for whatever wrong reason. So you have both of these. So in loving God, in developing this deep personal spiritual friendship with God, he will help us to love others in a right way so that we can develop this spiritual friendship with others. Uh, We human beings are really too... uh, we're too weak. We're really not capable of achieving deep spiritual friendships with other people. It's a very rare thing. Most of us are too, we're too flawed, you know, and we're too flawed and everybody's too flawed and you can't achieve a really beautiful, balanced, reciprocal friendship when you have people that are flawed. You need God's love. God's love is perfect. Yeah, not only that, it keeps that balance because, as you were explaining, the uh, wrong kind of uh, of love, uh, maybe in not loving yourself, uh, a lot of times you can become an enabler uh, of someone who really should um, not be doing what they're doing, but you, by not loving yourself and doing too much for them, you enable them to continue bad things, bad habits, uh, where a love of yourself would uh, put limits on what you can do and also might give you a better insight as to, okay, uh, this person has to do more for themselves. I'm doing it all. They're accepting it all because it's an easy way to live, but that's not the right way to live. And uh, so, yeah, this uh, anytime you take God out of the equation, something is going to start to tilt one way or the other. There's going to be an out-of-balance situation developing, and if it goes unchecked for too long, it gets, you know, can get very serious. So I think the person who has God in their life, uh, once they have that, mm, something's not right here, they have that feeling. They may not be able to explain it, but uh, in time, this feeling will bring them back to their center. And so things are back in balance. I mean, that's just how I think a lot of things work, and that includes your spiritual life. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, um, Maria, how are we going on time? Uh, because this topic can go on uh, 
in so many different ways. Uh, how are we doing on time, would you say? Oh, we actually have another 10 minutes or so. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, if you had some expanded thoughts, because um, the, this, um, I, I think um, in the news today, we're starting to see, uh, going back to the family and the spiritual love and, and all the things we just talked about, I, I think we're seeing the results, uh, maybe the bad results of some of these things in the, on the news. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of people that have, I don't know, I guess in, in their own way, good intentions or they want the best for some, some for some reason, but in some ways, to me, it's skewed because it doesn't have that balance that we were talking about. It, it has a very one-sided uh, agenda. Uh, it's not. It doesn't bring God's plan into into the um, into the thinking. Uh, or if it does, it's maybe very little, or maybe it's kind of a my version of God, which is, you know, that's relativism and, and uh, you know, my God, my truth. Uh, and, and I really, when I hear that, I really say, okay, we're going, we're, uh, we're going in a, in a bad direction because there's no such thing as my truth. There's the truth and there's no such thing as my God. There's God and it's the same God for everyone. It's the same truth for everyone. So that's where I think, Unless you have that strong family, strong spiritual friendship, uh, all of this, uh, that's where that kind of, uh, that's where good thinking gets started. That's the, the place where you hear it as a young person. Uh, it may be explained to you by your, your parents or your teachers or your, uh, you know, your pastor, your priest, uh, whatever. And, and so by the time you hit adult, young adulthood, you have that balanced uh, view that you need as opposed to maybe just, like I said, a little bit too far to one side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, God is, there's only one God, there's only one truth. And you know, I was thinking the other day, too, with God, the one true God, there are quite a few people who really do believe in the God that we believe in not only Catholics, and there's quite a few Catholics all over the world, and there's also many Protestants who believe in the same God, and also the Jewish people. You know, I mean, we, we share three-quarters of the Bible with Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and I really don't know um, if Muslims use our Bible at all. I know that they believe that God, Abraham is, the, is their father, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's some elements, at least, of the Old Testament. Well, the, the, I think the uh, yeah the the uh, the offspring, Abraham is the father, and I, I hope this is right. Uh, this is my general understanding. But uh, there were the offspring were from two different women, and uh, Isaac, Jacob, and that is the Christian version of going back to Abraham. And I forget the names for the. For, the, for Islam, but we all come back to uh, to Abraham, but it was because of different mothers. Does that sound right? Yeah, um, Abraham had two sons, one with Sarah, Isaac, yeah, yeah. and the other one with Hagar, I believe her name is yeah, Ishmael. Yeah, yeah. Ishmael. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it, yeah. Well, that started everything. I mean, that started in t going in two different directions, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, what I was saying, what the point I was trying to make was that there's quite a number of people on the face of the earth that believe in the same God. Yes, the Protestants, yes. the Catholics, and the Jews. You know, we we do have our different understandings, but it is the same God, and that's a, quite a number of people that that believe that. So already, there should be so much more consensus about who God is. And it's not that there is only one God. It's not like I have my God and you have your God, you know. Um, but nowadays, of course, so many people are just 
drifting away from the one true God, from their religion. Many Catholics, Protestants, Jews, I mean, many most Jews are very nominal or just cultural Jews. They really do not practice their religion. And then you have in all three of these, the Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, you have all three, you have some, some you have a fragment, a remnant that is very fundamental. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, if you look at the history, the, uh, the uh, Martin Luther, uh, what was that, 1500s or about that, uh, you, you know, it started going in a different direction, and then, you know, under the Protestant umbrella, you got, well, I think I heard, saw a number of 30,000 different churches, uh, denominations, you know, uh, uh, you have the mainstream, but then, a group of people might not like what's going on. They may not like the new pastor, and so they form their own little church, which goes on for two or three years, and then a couple of people there don't like what some changes or what's what's going on in general, so they splinter, splinter off. So that's how you end up with all these little churches. I mean, once again, I'm not being critical so much as I'm trying to explain the reason why there's so many different ideas. Um, Within the Catholic Church, you know, Catholics, uh, a true Catholic believes in the Trinity and the Incarnation and the Resurrection and, you know, just read the Creed. Uh, That's what Catholics believe. Uh, But these other churches that have splintered off, I don't know if they have a creed uh, like that or if it's more kind of a community thing and people kind of free flow in and out depending on if that particular church suits their opinion about certain things. I mean, that's what I've seen from a, from a distance. But uh, that's and, and with some discussions, a couple of discussions with people uh, that belong to those churches. And they're good people. I don't Again, don't take my comments wrong. There's good people and they're very devout people. It's just that when you have all the different views, it comes about from all the different uh, Places of worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely a very big topic too. All the, all the differences. In, there's one God, and yet so many people do view God in their in many different ways. Um, and so much of the time, it's really people trying to, trying to understand who God is but often trying to bring him down to the human level, which yeah. is an absurdity and an, and an impossibility. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, like I said, uh, at least don't give the Catholic Church credit. We have a catechism. We have a creed. You pretty much know what we stand for because it's written down. Uh, you may not agree with it, and but uh, at least, uh, you know, over the centuries, the church uh, has pretty much established what it believes, uh, you know, the dogma of the church, uh, you know, those things that can't change uh, because they are part of the church that Jesus started and we can't change that. Yeah, yeah. We we are so, so blessed to be part of the Catholic faith where we have this stability, this constancy, this authority to me, it's such a relief because without it, I would have to make up my own rules, and that's such a burden and such a responsibility, you know? Oh, well, once again, that's the thing. When you run across a uh, moral decision that has to be made, you turn to church teaching. That's what the church is there for. It's like when you get up and you, you're sick, you go to the doctor. That's what the doctor's there for. Or you get a call and you're suddenly involved in a lawsuit, you get a lawyer. That's what the lawyer's there for. Well, guess what, folks? Life has a lot of moral issues and a lot of moral decisions that have to be made. You don't have to do it on your own. It's already been figured out by the best minds that have ever lived, especially with um, Jesus as the founder. But just go to church teaching. There's your There's your roadmap there's your guideline for how to handle it yeah now you might have said this in a previous show but i was thinking about it just because now there's so there's more and more rules regulations you know thrust on people you can't do this you can't say that 
if you said something like this 10 years ago, then it means that you're a horrible person. You shouldn't, you know, all these things. Um, I guess I'm really referring to the, um, the cancel culture and all these things, all these rules, laws, rules that weren't in effect before. Now they're rules. And now you should have followed them 10 years ago, even though they weren't, they weren't in effect then. That just really, the absurdity makes me, uh, I, I don't even know. I, don't, I can't even wrap my brain around it. But something either you said or maybe both of you said, I remember somebody else saying, when you take away the Ten Commandments, about 100 million have to come in, and they're always changing. Okay, I I don't recognize that exact statement, but uh, I think I said something along those lines, uh, although I can't exactly say what it was. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, just... You, you got um, you, you got some guidelines that if they're supposed to be unchanging, uh, that's proof. Uh, and when they change every with with the fads every you know ten twenty years because the you know the culture is different, then you got nothing. It's, it's you're, you're either current or old fashioned or, or ahead of your time. And how, how do you deal with that? How do you live in that kind of, of, a, of a society? Whereas if you have unchanging rules that are based on the truth, then you, you know where you stand. You, you know you're in your own personal life where you are and what needs to be fixed or maybe what is good, and you just continue to promote that and try to you know develop that to a higher level. So I, I always like that about the church is that uh, uh, we, we know who our founder was. We know the the magisterium, the teaching of the church, uh, I mean the, uh, the teaching authority of the church. And all of that is so important to have the stability that one needs in their spiritual life. Yeah, absolutely. And with all these things that are going on in the world nowadays, we just see that people have no sense of what is right and what is wrong. They're just making, you know, really willy-nilly making up things. You can't say this. You can't say that. It's like, really? And then they'll change. Then they'll change. And you were wrong. And if you if you did what, what they told you to do 10, 15 years ago, and and now you are wrong for doing it. It's all this willy nilly. They they're confused. They they're confused themselves, and they're confusing everybody around them. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I was saying. If you're every ten, twenty years, the culture changes, the fads change. How do you live with something like that? You can't. It's impossible. Uh, you're either current or you're old fashioned or you're too a far into the future. You, you know, uh, or something that is consistent unchanging and we know where it comes from we know it to be the truth that is your that's your rock that's 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 keeps you balanced that keeps you grounded and um, that's how you i think deal with all the issues that come 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 about in life you know and you know there's going to be plenty of them to deal with so you might as well have a good system to, to work them out Right, like a good foundation, exactly. Yeah, we're yeah, missing yeah. that. We're, we're missing the whole foundation, and everything is crumbling. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, okay, yeah. um, Maria, did we pretty much uh, fill yeah. the uh, our time slot? Uh, because uh, we got some other things, but we can certainly talk about them uh, at a different time. Yeah, uh, we're done for today. We can talk about them. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, then um, let's close. Let's close with a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Take care, Maria. Have a good week. You too, Dave. Bye-bye. God bless everybody. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, 
for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.